Welcome back everybody to another Swift programming language tutorial. This will be part two of our basics series where we will go over strings and characters. You can think of a Swift string as a series of characters, words, text, or other data put inside double quotes of the string type. A Swift character is very similar to a string except that it just usually consists of one character and is of the character type. Okay, a quick review on variables. If you want to declare a string variable that will change, then you use the var, reserved, or keyword. If you want to create a string variable that will not change, then you use the let keyword. Okay, so let's jump right into our first example. And for our first example, we're just going to go over how to create a simple string. So the first thing you want to do is declare your keyword var or let. In this case, we just use var. Then you give your variable a name. We've given our variable the name string1. Then we use a single equal sign for assignment, and then we assign the value. In this case, the string1 variable will infer the type to be of string. If you'd like to explicitly state the type, you can do that like this. So notice that this syntax here is basically the same as this syntax, except for one difference, and that is we explicitly stated the type. And to do that, you just put a colon after your variable name here, and then you state the type, which is type string. Okay, and then you can see some information about that type here. And one way to do that is just put your cursor over the text and hit the option key until you see the question mark and click it. Okay, there are two simple easy ways to create an empty string. One way looks like this, where you just use your variable syntax, var or let give the variable a name, and then assign, using the single equal sign, an empty string. So it's just two double quotes put together, okay? Now another way to create an empty string, which is basically the same as this, but using the initializer syntax, looks like this. So again, you just use your reserved word, var or let, give the variable a name, and then assign the initializer syntax that looks like this. Okay, now for the most part, these two ways to create an empty string will work basically the same. So let's go ahead and test that. So now we can go ahead and assign a real value to string 3. So let's pull up string 3. And let's just assign a string value of hello there. Now if we want to assign a value to string 4, we just use the variable string 4. And in this case, we'll just say hello there again. So now we can go ahead and use a print to display the values of string 3 and 4. Let's go ahead and run this. And you can see we get our output down here in the console. To make this just a little bit more readable, let's go ahead and separate this out. Run it again. And you can see this is the output for string 3, and this is the output for string 4. So in both cases, we created a string variable and then assigned the values at a later time. Okay, let's go ahead and get rid of that. Let's move on to our next example. So in this example, what we want to do is we want to access the first character in this string here. So let's go ahead and uncomment our print statement. Now to access the first character, what we're going to do is we're going to reference our string, string 5, and then we're going to use the square brackets, similar to a type of subscript syntax, and inside the square brackets we're going to reference our string again, and then we're going to use a dot to access the start index. Okay, so here's some information about the start index. Now since we put this inside of a print, this should go ahead and display the first character in our string. It's going to be a phenomenal day. Let's go ahead and run our code. And if we set this up correctly, we should get I and we do. Okay, because you can see the first character in our string is capital I. Moving on to our next example, let's say that you wanted to access the last character in a string. So here we have our string. Let's go ahead and uncomment out our print statement. Comment that one back out. And again, we're going to reference our string, string six. And then inside the square brackets subscript syntax, we reference our string again. We use a dot to access the index. There's some quick information about the index. 
And inside the index function round brackets, we're going to use before, and then we're going to reference the string again, and then use a dot to access the end index. Okay, now one note, and this is kind of important, very often the end index is the position after the last character in the string, okay? So the last character in this string is the exclamation point, so the last character in the string is here, the exclamation, and the end index would be right after it. Okay, so it'd be right here. Now, in order to access the last character, we need to use the word before. Otherwise, you would be accessing a character after the last character, which in a sense would give you back nothing. Okay, so let's go ahead and run our code. And we should get back the exclamation point. And we do. Okay, so let's just do a quick recap. Again, to access the last character, you reference the string, then you use your square brackets. You can see the square brackets start here and end here. Then we reference the string again, use a dot to access the index, and then inside the index, make sure you use the before. Then you reference the string again, a dot to access the end index. Okay. Moving on to our next example, let's say that you wanted to access some character in the middle of a string. So here we have some letters. This should be the alphabet. We've assigned it to the variable string 7. Next we create another variable called string 7 index and this will be our index. Now to create our index, we reference our string 7, then we use a dot to access the index and inside the index round brackets we reference our string again use a dot to access the start index, and then we use a comma, and then we use an offset, okay? And after the offset, you specify the number of the offset for the index. So here we've used a three, so what this should do is it should start at the start index here, and then go forward three places, okay? So this would be zero, a would be 0, B would be 1, C would be 2, and D should be 3. Now let's go ahead and uncomment this print, comment this out. So now we can reference our string 7 again here. We've put this inside of a print to display the outcome. And then we use our square bracket subscript syntax and we put our index inside the square brackets. Okay? This is our index that we've created. We put that inside the square brackets subscript syntax, referencing our string 7 here. So again, as we mentioned, using this syntax here, we started at the start index and offset by 3. And from the example we showed, we should end up at the letter D in our string here. So let's go ahead and print this out. And if we've set this up correctly, this sh should return the letter D. Okay, so you can see down here in the console, we get back the expected letter D. Okay, so that's just one way you can access a character in the middle of a string. Moving on to our next example. Let's say that you wanted to access a set of characters in a string or a substring. Now we're going to do this using a range. So we've gone ahead, we've created our variable with the string, seize the day. And what we want to do is we want to create a start index and an end index. So here we've created our start index, and here we have created our end index. Then we're going to use those start and end indexes in a range here. And then finally, we should be able to return that substring with this syntax. Okay, so let's go over our start index syntax here. So we reference our string8 variable that we created here. Then we use a dot to access the index, and inside the index round brackets, we reference our string again, a dot to access the start index. Then we use our comma, and then we use our offset. Okay, so when you're creating syntax like this and you're using the offset, sometimes you have to play around with these offset numbers a little bit to give you exactly what you want. So what we have done here is, again, we've started with our start index and our string, and we've offset it by six. So let's go ahead and count forward six places, starting at zero. So we start at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so that should put us right about here, right around the T. So that's our start index. Now to create the end index, notice that the syntax is very similar, 
except instead of a start index, we use an end index, and then we use a negative number for the offset. So when you do that, you start at the end of the string, and then you count five places going towards the beginning of the string. Okay, so as we mentioned, sometimes you have to play with these numbers a little bit to give you exactly what you want. But if we start at the end index of the string and count five places going towards the beginning, that would be one, two, three, four, five, and that should put us right around here. So at this point, what we should expect is the word the to be returned. Okay, so let's move on explaining our code. So we've created our start index and our end index. So we've created a start point and an end point. Now we should be able to create a range that will go from the start index to the end index, and we do that using this syntax here. Okay, so we've created a variable, we've assigned our range to that variable, and to create the range, we use our start index here, then we use our range syntax. So you'll notice it's, in this case, two dots and a less than symbol. Now sometimes you can create a range that looks like that, which is three dots, but in order for this code to work, we need to use two dots and then a less than. And basically what this will do is it will go from the start index to the end index. So it should go from right around here, starting at the T to the E, returning the word the. Now finally here, this is where we create our substring. Okay, now in order to do that, again, we reference the string eight. We use a dot to access the substring. And inside the substring round brackets, we use with, and then we put in our range. So let's uncomment our print, comment out our previous print, and run our code. And as we mentioned, if we've set this up correctly to pull out a set of characters or a substring, we should be able to pull out the word the here in the middle of the string. Let's run our code. And you can see down here in the console, we get the, okay? So that's just one way that you can pull out a set of characters or a substring from a string. So again, let's just do a quick recap. The first thing you wanna do is create your start index. Then you wanna create your end index. Then you want to create a range using the start index that will go to the end index. Then you use your range to specify your set or substring. And then here we just use a print to display the final output. Okay, so let's move on to our next example. In this example, we want to insert characters into a string. So here we've gone ahead and created our string. And it says today it is outside. So what we want to do is add an adjective to this string. And specifically, we want to add nice. So we want it to say, today it is nice outside. Now to do that, we reference our string nine, then we use a dot to access the insert, and then inside the insert round brackets, we want to specify what we want to insert into the string, and you can see that says contents of, and we want to insert the characters of the word nice into our string nine. Now make sure that you specify characters, so it will insert the characters of the word nice into your string. Then we use a comma and we specify at, okay? So this should tell it where to insert those characters. Then after the at, we reference our string again, use a dot to access the index. Inside the index, we reference our string yet again, a dot to access the start index and our offset. So we're using the offset of 13 so if we start at the beginning of our string and we count 13 places, start at zero. So we start at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So it should put it right about there. Let's go ahead and uncomment our print. Let's go ahead and run our code. And you can see we get back our string here. Today it is nice outside. So the original string was Today it is outside, and we've gone ahead and inserted the characters of the word nice. Okay, so moving on to our next example. In this example, we want to remove characters from a string. Now notice that the syntax here is very similar to the syntax that we created up here. So we've gone ahead and we've created our string. Then we create a start index 
just like we did here, we create an end index. We've gone ahead and created a range here using our start and end index. And then this syntax will remove that range of text. So basically this here is the same as this, except for when we get down to the part where we want to remove our subrange. That's where the main difference is. So we go ahead and we reference our string. Then we use a dot to access the remove subrange function. And here's some information about that function. And then inside the remove subrange function, we put the range that we've specified that we want to remove. So again, we created our start index, our end index. We use that start and end index to create a range. And then we remove that range. So before we run this, let's go over quickly what we think this should remove. So we start at the start index. We use the offset to count by 12. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that should put us right here at the B. For our end index, we start at the end of the string and we count back five. So that's one, two, three, four, five. So that should put us right about here. Now, again, as I mentioned before, if this 12 and this negative five don't work exactly, don't be afraid to play with those numbers a little bit to give you exactly what you want. But let's go ahead and try this and see if we can remove the word big from this string. Okay, so it looks like it worked. We went ahead and removed big from there is no big rush. And now we have the string there is no rush. Okay, moving on to our next example. What we want to do here is to test strings for equality. So we have two strings. At this point in time, they are equal. And what we can do is we can use an if statement. And we can say is string 11 equal to, and notice that we use two equal signs string 12. So is string 11 equal to string 12? Are they equivalent? Let's go ahead and uncomment our prints. So this code is going to test for equality. And if both of the strings are the same, it should return, yes, we are the same. If they're not the same, it should return not the same. Okay, so you can see that it returned, yes, we are the same and you can see that the strings are indeed the same. Now let's change one little character and run the code again, and since they're not the same now, we should get back not the same. Okay, so the equality test is working. We should be good to go. Okay, next up, let's go over how to use prefix with strings. So here we've gone ahead and we've created an array with different types of cats. Now what we want to do with this code is count the number of cats in our array that have the prefix bangle, okay? So the first thing we want to do is create a start point for our count. So we created a variable, set that equal to zero. And we haven't gone over some of this code yet, like for loops and if statements, but we will go over that soon. The main thing we want to do here is just show you how you can use the prefix with strings. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use a for loop to loop through this array here. And then if any of those elements in that array has the prefix bangle, then we want to add that to our count. So inside our if statement, we reference the i that we created in our for loop, which will iterate through all of the elements in this array. And then we use the has prefix, and then we specify the prefix that we're looking for. Then we use our special syntax here, which will create a sort of running total, and each time it encounters bangle, it will add that to the count. Okay, so let's go ahead and uncomment our print statement. And if this code doesn't make perfect sense to you just yet, don't worry. We're going to go over all kinds of examples of how to use for loops and if statements and running totals in our future tutorials. Now, before we run this, let's do a quick look at our array and see what we think this should be. So let's go ahead and count the number of cats that have bangle as a prefix. So there's one, two, three. So it looks like there's three. Let's go ahead and run this and see if our count matches. That's good, we get back three, and that's what we expected. Okay, so that's just one way that you can use code to help you count 
elements of an array with strings depending on the criteria that you set for a prefix. Now you can do something very similar using a suffix. So let's go over an example of that. So again, here we create a variable that will help us to start our count. We start our count out at zero. Then we use a for loop to iterate through our array. So this for loop here is going to iterate through this array and it's gonna look at each individual element. Then we use an if here, and what this code does is it says if any of the elements in that array has the suffix tiger. So if the part at the end of each element of that array has tiger, then we want to go ahead and add that element to our count. So again, let's go ahead and look at our array and see and count for ourselves the number of tigers as a suffix. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so let's run our code and we should get back eight. Okay, you can see down here in the console, we get back eight. That's what we expected, that's good. Okay, moving on to our next example. What we want to do here is test a string to see if it's empty. So here we've gone ahead and created our empty string. Then we use an if statement to help us test that string to see if it's empty. So we use the reserved word if, then we reference our string, and then we use a dot to access is empty. And if that string is empty, then we want to go ahead and return the message the string is empty. And then else or otherwise, if it's not empty, print not empty. So we can clearly see the string is empty, so this should return the string is empty. Let's run it. And you can see we get back what we expected, the string is empty. Now let's put something inside here and run it again, and now we should get back not empty. Okay, moving on. So let's say that you had a string that says good morning, and you wanted to put that in all uppercase form. Now one way you can do that is to use the uppercase function. So we created our string, and then we create another variable, and we assign that same string, and we converted it to uppercase using the uppercase function. So let's go ahead and run our code, and what we should get back now is good morning all uppercase. Okay, so that looks good. In another example, let's say that you started with an uppercase string and you wanted to convert that to lowercase. To do that, we created a variable and we assign our string 15, use a dot to access the lowercase function, and now we have a new variable with good morning that was in all uppercase in lowercase. So let's go ahead and run that. And we have good morning all in lowercase. Okay, so those are just two quick examples of how you can manipulate a string to be uppercase or lowercase. Moving on to our next example, let's say that you wanted to count the number of elements in a string. So here we have our string, it's the alphabet. Let's uncomment our print, comment out that print. Now in order to get the count for the elements in that string, we've gone ahead and put this all inside of a print to display. We reference the string, then we use a dot to access the characters, and then we use another dot to access the count. So let's go ahead and run this. Assuming we set up our alphabet correctly, we should get back 26. Okay, we get back 26, that's good. Moving on to our next example. Here we have a string, and we just filled it with words. And in this case, what we want to do is count the number of spaces in this string. Okay, so we can see that there are one, two, three spaces, but we want to create some code to do that for us. So one way you can do this is reference the string, then use a dot to access the characters. Then we use another dot to access the filter function. And here's some information about the filter function. And then we create some syntax here used with our filter function, similar to a closure or an inline function. And we're gonna go over more examples of the filter function and closures in future tutorials, 
But just know for now that a closure is very similar to a function or a anonymous function or an inline function. And what this syntax will do inside the curly brackets is it will look at our string 16 and it will count any of the characters that are spaces. And we specified the spaces here with the double quotes because there's a space in between the double quotes. And as I mentioned, it will count those. And to do that, we just at the outside of the last curly bracket, use a dot and the count. So let's go ahead and run this. And since we already counted the spaces, it should be three. Let's see if our code counts those spaces correctly for us as well. OK, we get back three. We're good to go. OK, moving on to our next example. We're going to go over string interpolation. And what this does is it allows you to insert variables or operations into a string. So we've gone ahead and we've created two variables. The first variable is Superman, and then the second is Kryptonite. So what we want to do is insert these two smaller strings into a larger string. Now to do that, we can use the string interpolation syntax, which looks like this. So it's a backslash and then the round brackets and then whatever you want to insert, you put inside the round brackets. So for this string, we should get back Superman's weakness is kryptonite. So it's going to take this superhero variable and put it here. And it's going to take this weakness variable and put it here. Let's go ahead and run it. And we get back our string with the other variables inserted into our larger string. OK, moving on to our last example, what we want to do here is just go over a quick example of how to declare a character and then use that character somehow. OK, so again, we haven't gone over switch statements yet, but just know for now that switch statements are very similar to a bunch of if statements put together. So first things first, to create a character, you can use this syntax here. Let's fix our spacing here. OK, so again, you declare a character very similar to how you would declare a string. You use the var or let keyword, give your variable a name. However, it's better to go ahead and explicitly state the type. So you use your colon, and then you state the character type. Then you use an equals to assign the value, and then you assign your character. So let's just go ahead and pretend that this is a grade. And what we want to do is use this with a switch, or sometimes called a switch case statement. And this switch statement is going to look at the character. So it's going to look at this character here. And then it's going to run through a series of cases. And depending on what this character is, it's going to match it up with the case and then return a statement in reference to that character variable. OK, so our character variable is A. We've gone ahead and created some cases here. And as we mentioned, you can just pretend these are grades. And whichever case matches our character, we want to get back a statement regarding that grade. OK, so we have five cases, each case that will look at the different grades, A, B, C, D, and F. We've gone ahead and put in a default here, just in case somebody tried to put in a character here that's not a grade. And since we know that the character is A, we should get back this statement. So let's go ahead and run this. And since we got an A, it should say you got the highest grade. Great job. OK, so that's what we get. You got the highest grade. Great job. Now, another thing to note on this case statement, since we put in a lowercase and an uppercase, if we change this to an A, let's go ahead and comment out this previous print statement here. If we change this to a capital A, we should get back the same string, you got the highest grade. And that's what we get. That's good. Now let's put something else in here. Let's put in a B and see if we get back, you got a B. OK, that's good. We got back what we expected. Now if we put in a character in here that's not a grade, we should get back the default statement. OK. That's good. We got back not a grade because Z is not a grade. At least as far as I know, most of the time Z is not a grade. 
Okay, so that's it for this tutorial on strings and characters. We did go over several parts of the Swift language that we haven't covered yet, but don't worry because we're going to go over all of those parts more in future tutorials and in much more detail. So join us for our future Swift tutorials, and we'll see you next time.